Hello, and welcome to our program, Ebonics and the African Connection. I have in my hands a doctoral dissertation entitled Creole Source Language Linguistic Relatedness, uh, written by Dr. Jerry Klein Bailey, a associate professor of English and linguistics at Xavier University, who was our guest for today. Hi, Dr. Jerry Klein Bailey. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> indeed, and indeed. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Um, let's begin our discussion. You have a bit of an accent there. Um, are you from the United States? No, I'm from Sierra Leone in West Africa. Sierra Leone in West Africa? Mm -hmm. um, and you speak English very well. Is that an English-speaking country? Yes, yeah, Sierra Leone was colonized by the British, and um, so uh, we were there, therefore influenced by British um, English. And you speak how many different languages? Five different languages, <laughs> which I should add is not um, unique. Um, the average person in the part of Africa where I grew up uh, speaks three languages. Um, so it's not uncommon for people who've never been to school to speak five, four, uh, six, or more languages. And um, people then speak English. Every, everyone speaks English there, in addition to three or four other languages, perhaps. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Um, English is the official language of Sierra Leone. Um, however, the degree of competence in the English language um, varies widely depending on the level of education. But we do have an English-based lingua franca, uh, which is uh, a Creole language called Creole. It's related to English. In fact, 80% of its uh, vocabulary is uh, from English. Um, and that language um, is spoken by um, over 90% of the population. So, in other words, what you're saying is that in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. West Africa, mm -hmm. uh, the English from England mm -hmm. um, colonized the area. Mm -hmm. And 80% of the language that grew out of the native speaking people learning the Queen's English is a language that you all call Creole. Creole, it, yes. And it's spelled, it's spelled differently from the C-R-E-A-O-L-E. -E. It's K. Yes, K-R-I-O. And that's a specific um, language, I think. Yes. Um, it, however, is a little more complex than that. Um, some researchers believe uh, that Creole um, was the result of a certain substrate, because the first... Uh, European settlers in West Africa were Portuguese. And it is believed that a Portuguese-based Creole language was then used as uh, a trade language in West Africa. After the British superseded the uh, Portuguese, um, it is believed that English uh, lexical items and certain English structures was uh, imposed, superimposed on top of that um, Portuguese, African, Creole language. And this is believed to be uh, the process by which uh, Creole, K-R-I-O, was developed. But, but in both instances, it's African adaptation to European linguistic systems. Yes, yes, certainly. And, and you speak both, you speak both Creole, K-R-I-O-L. Oh, right. As well as English, the English that you and I are talking. Yes, yes, so certainly. How would you say, uh, good morning, how do you do in Creole? I uh, would say something like, how you do? How you uh, do? Yes, how you do? Um, in Creole, as how are you, right? But uh, good, good morning, um, I could say, kushe, which also means uh, thanks for doing a big job. So it depends on the context. 
So I could see you in the morning and say kushe, right, uh, as a greeting, or if you've done particularly well, I could use that same greeting, and it would mean something else. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so very good. Are there any R's on the, in the words uh, distinctively in that language? Yes. How do you say, how do you say mother in that Creole language? Mm -hmm. That's mama. Mama? <laughs> yes, oh. which is universal okay. in almost every culture. You what about father? Mama. It's Papa. Papa, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, are there any words that, yeah. that, that end in R? That end in an E. Uh, okay, e I see where you're going English. with this. Yeah. Um, in Sierra Leone Creole, the um, R at the end of uh, words like father, mother, um, is often not pronounced in the same way that American English would. Um, in fact, uh, in other phonological um, situations, the R is uh, um, of a different quality. Uh, for example, my first name is Jerry. Um, in Sierra Leone, it would be pronounced Jerry. The R is somewhat akin to the French or Arabic R. Um, it's articulated uh, further back. Um, in the oral passage. But one of the things that I'm trying to establish here mm -hmm. is w one of the things that people say that Ebonics, mm -hmm. that is black English as we call it in the United States, yes. um, one characteristic of it is that it doesn't have ERs yes. on the end of words. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if that's a characteristic of Ebonics in its generic sense, which suggests all African language, language systems adapt to European language systems? Okay, there are two answers to that question. Um, many of the dialects which were brought over from England to Africa were R less dialects. In other words, at the end of words like player, mother, father, that R is not pronounced. So one answer would be that um, Africans were influenced by the speech of um, English, the English from whom they heard that they learned the language. Um, and it may also uh, be explained that these, this variety, or these British varieties, influenced um, American English through the Africans. So, so we're talking about African influencing European language systems and mm. Europeans influencing right. language, African language. Right. Now, let's, let's try to get into this area of ebonics and connect it with your, with your background. Mm -hmm. um, how did you become interested in studying language? You're a professor now at Xavier University. Yes. Mm. Um, you got your PhD in 1992, University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the classic study mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. I uh, suggested earlier. I'm calling it the classic mm -hmm. study because mm -hmm. you're going you to make it a <laughs> classic study. <laughs> Thank you, you. You're, doing, you're doing further research now to, to uh, um, add on to the findings yes. that you already have. Yes. Uh, but what, what got you interested in this? Uh, a person in Africa, Sierra mm -hmm. Leone, uh, coming over to the United States studying Ebonics, mm -hmm. black language. What's the connection there? Yes. Um, well, it's a long story. I'll try to give you a short version of it. Um, as I already intimated, I grew up in Sierra Leone, West Africa, which is uh, a very multilingual part of the world. Uh, there are lots of languages. The average person speaks, you know, three languages. Um, and I was always interested in the relationship between English and Creole. Um, because even when I was very young, I could distinguish that these were two different languages, although some people thought that Creole was just bad English. But I could tell from the structure, the sound system, and so on and so forth, that this was, in fact, a different linguistic system, a different language from English. Even as a, a, a youngster, you could tell that. Yes, yes, I certainly could. And um, I was interested... Um, 
always interested in how um, Creole came to be another language. How come um, we have these different words in Creole? And not only that, but how we, where did these other African languages, these, Afri these African words that we find in Creole, where do they come from? Um, and so when I got to university, university, I studied English, that was my major, um, but it wasn't only English literature, but English language and literature. And um, I began to study about uh, the Creole, the Creole languages. And uh, the more I read, the more fascinated I became. So upon graduation, I was lucky I got a research assistantship uh, to remain in the English department. I later on went uh, to England uh, where I got a master's in applied linguistics. Um, and uh, for my master's thesis, I worked on you know, the uh, phonetics of Creole. So I went back to the University of Sierra Leone um, and I felt that there was a lot more work to be done because I had read a few articles, uh, scholarly articles written on Creole by non-native speakers of the language whom I felt did not really understand the essence of Creole and therefore I, I saw a number of problems. So um, as I wanted to continue working in this area, it was suggested to me that the U.S. might be a fertile uh, ground for this kind of research. One, because there, were a lot, there was a lot of uh, funding for that kind of research, uh, lots of universities, and there also is the um, link, the link between Africa and the U.S. in the African-American community. So I thought, this is excellent. And this was how I found my way to the University of Texas, um, you know, following this uh, trail of uh, language, this linguistic trail. Now, when I arrived at the University of Texas, um, I was uh, informed um, of a language which was supposedly spoken by uh, people of African descent in a small town called Brackettsville. It's on the uh, Texas-Mexico border, close to the border. And so uh, one weekend, uh, one of my professors and I made a journey to Brackettsville to investigate uh, this language. Uh, to cut a lo long story sh short, um, after being informed uh, that there was no such language, uh, we um, discovered, in fact, that there was one. Uh, by so you're saying that you, you went to this this place, and these yes. African people, yes. and it's on, they're on the border of Texas and Mexico, yes, and they are reputed to have their own language, yes. And you and your professor of linguistics, yes, uh, visit this place and mm -hmm. visit a bar, yes, and you ask the people, do they speak a different language, and they they denied it, yes. And then what happened? And uh, before leaving, we decided to try um, something. And so just a few, utter a few words in uh, Creole, asking. Your, your professor knew Creole as well as you? Yes, we both were working on Creole. And, right. And, and you, you decided to and say to use, something. To use a few words in Creole. And this sparked interest. Automatically, people start looking at you. Yes, listening because to you. people could understand what we were saying. These people felt that the variety um, that they were speaking, that they spoke amongst themselves, only amongst themselves, was unique to that small Afro Seminole community in Texas. And you said Afro Seminole? Yes. As in Seminole Indians yes. in Florida? Yes. Now, how did that get in the picture, Seminole? Okay, and this is another long story. Uh, I'll take you, uh, take you to uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. Um, in the 1700s, um, planters wanted to start rice cultivation because the land in uh, the Carolinas, off the Sea Islands, around the Sea Islands, 
um, was not uh, good for the cultivation of many crops because it's very swampy, marshy. And so uh, they decided that uh, they could cultivate rice because if you look at the, the terrain, it's very similar to uh, the rice paddies in um, Asia. So they decided, well, rice might be a good uh, crop for this, um, this kind of uh, terrain. So they um, specifically tried to get slaves from a specific part of Africa where rice was the staple food. So they would get slaves from the rice coast, that is the area between um, the Senegal and Gambia in northwest Africa, right down to uh, Liberia further down the coast. This area is known as the Rice Coast. And in contrast to what appears to have been the practice of uh, slave owners, which was to mix slaves from different parts of Africa so they couldn't communicate with each other, here the pecuniary motive was so great that the uh, slavers appear to have made a concession in this situation because they wanted slaves who knew how to cultivate rice. They chose slaves from a specific area, slaves who had a similar linguistic background. The result was that you have um, small communities of blacks, well, relatively large communities of blacks who could communicate um, with each other. And one of the reasons why the slavers didn't want slaves who uh, all sp spoke the same language was because they could then communicate with each other and plan rebellion or plan to run away. And this was precisely what happened. Um, very often in North Carolina and Georgia, the slaves escaped into the marshes and they hooked up with renegade Indians outlaw Indians um, and formed communities of Afro-Seminoles. Now we have to remember the, the, the word Seminole. Um, the Seminoles were not an Indian tribe or an Indian nation, but rather they were bands of runaway or wild, quote unquote, Creek um, Indians. Yes, Indians, right. So these hooked up with um, the Africans and um, they, they traveled over vast di distances, and we have communities of these um, Afro-Seminoles dotted in various parts of the Southwest, uh, extending as far south as Florida and uh, Mexico across the border in Mexico. We have communities of these um, African Americans, Af Afro-Seminoles, who speak varieties related to the Gala, which was spoken by um, slaves from the Rice Coast in... So let's get this straight now. Mm -hmm. You came all the way over here mm -hmm. from Africa yes. to study at the university in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And within a few miles, let's say, of your university, there was mm -hmm. a community of people, mm -hmm. uh, African uh, native community on the border of Texas that spoke the same language or a very similar language as you spoke in Africa. Yes, a related variety, which is uh, in many cases mutually intelligible. So they understood what you were saying when you right. were speaking their secret language. Mm -hmm. Right. That's exactly what I'm saying. And that's a form of Ebonics is what you're saying. Now you're saying that Ebonics has to do with the African adaptation to the, in this case, English structure and, and also native influence as well in this case. Certainly, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, um, some researchers refer to Ebonics as Africanized English in the sense that uh, um, African languages have influenced the way Africans um, use the English language. So you'll find lexical items in the language of, in the English of African Americans, which were brought over 
these lexical items were brought over with them. They had knowledge of their original African languages and they introduced those words into the, the English that they spoke. So we have the lexical. When you uh, say level. lexical, you mean just vocabulary? You mean Vocabulary items. G give me some examples of that. Words like what, banjo? Right, well words that have uh, now, some of them have found their way into standard American English. Um, goober. Like goober peas, peanuts. Yes, yes for, for peanuts. Uh, you have okra. The, 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 the vegetable okra. Yes, yes. Um, um, you have gumbo, which gumbo. means, which is another word for okra. It's an African word for okra. But um, in the U.S., when we say, uh, when we use that word, gumbo, we're thinking about a specific dish. Right, right. This is a dish which was influenced by African cuisine. Right, and right. That's, that's both in, I guess, New, uh, Louisiana and South Carolina have good gumbo, gumbo right. dishes. Right, right. But you see that an important ingredient it's of okra. gumbo, right, is, yes, okra and rice. Okay. Now, so then you speak Ebonics, you study Ebonics, hmm. and um, you're, you're con continuing to study Mm -hmm. um, and advance your understanding of the language. One contribution that your study is making, I think, that I haven't heard before, is that you're actually arguing that African Americans went back to Africa and influenced the African language there. Yes. So not, not only is Ebonics, are you saying that when Africans were brought as enslaved people, they influenced the English language in the Western Hemisphere, but then they took that language, took it back to Africa, and influenced African language. This is what mm -hmm. you're arguing. Yes. Um, this part of the research um, I uh, kind of stumbled upon by, first of all, working with uh, the word Seminole. Now, you may remember I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Africans hooked up with Seminole Indians, right? The word Seminole um, comes from Spanish, Cimarron, which means wild. Um, a cognate of that word found in French is Maron, wild. Um, the English cognate is Maroon, so the Maroons uh, are a group of wild, quote unquote, slaves. Right, okay. Now, what um, my research is showing is that some of these Maroons, these wild Africans, fought on the side of the British in the War of, an Amer of American Independence. They were promised their freedom and land. The British didn't win the war. They couldn't give them the, la the land they'd promised them. But they did offer them some land in Nova Scotia. Um, the Africans didn't like it there. And later on, a few years later, they were given the option of going back to Africa. And shiploads of them did do that. They went back to Africa and settled in parts of West Africa. They specifically had a, um, a settlement, which they called Freetown in celebration of their freedom from slavery. And Freetown is today the capital of Sierra Leone. Right? And that community of returned Africans um, influenced the language I spoke of at the beginning, which is spelled K-R-I-O, Creole. So my research is looking also at the influence of African Americans on la language as uh, it's spoken in Africa today. So that Creole then is both influenced by queen, the Queen Mother's English, hmm. as well as Africans in America who went back to Africa with the, uh, let's say, United States version of English, yes. as well yes. as some other variations and influence that language. Yes, there are a multiplicity of connections. You have the English connection, you have the African connection, because you have to remember, though, that English was in a multilingual setting in West Africa. There were people from different linguistic uh, groups in Africa
being influenced by English. So when the creolization begins, the process begins to take place, it's English and a bunch of other African languages forming a new language, which it is believed by some was brought over to the US. This was flavored by perhaps the Native American influence and other aspects of the American influence and taken back to Africa to continue the linguistic progression. Now, we, we've got just a couple of minutes more. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an example of what you mean by, you, we say there's syntax, there's semantics. Syntax has to do with the structure of a language. Semantics has to do with its vocabulary. Right. Uh, give me an example of syntactically what's meant by this uh, ebonics. Okay. Um, I have looked at the Niger-Congo languages spoken in much of sub-Saharan uh, Saharan Africa. We've got just about one minute. Right, so. okay. And I've tried to show how these uh, languages uh, would express tense in English translation. So the present tense would be he go. He go. Right. The near past, he gone. Remote past, he been gone. Right. Future, he go and go. Right. Aspects of progress, he going. Um, aspects of completion, he done gone. Okay, so that goes, what right. you're saying then is in those languages in West Africa, this is how African people talk, express right. their verbs. Yes. So when you hear an African American say, he go, yes. rather than he uh, is going, uh, yes. he is talking uh, syntactically like a person in Africa we would be right. expressing the C verb. Certainly, this is what happens in most cases where someone is learning a second language. The first language influences the way they approach the second language. So there's structure to this thing called Ebonics. Certainly. In about 30 seconds, give us an example of semantics. Okay, we can take the word uh, bad, for, for example, in, in English. No. In West African Creole, for example, right, I could say, I like I'm bad, meaning I like something very well. Well, in Ebonics, you know, someone is a bad bas basketball player, means that person is, is good. really good. So you see, even the word bad itself mm -hmm. means, or has to do with Afri how Africans use language, right. and that's an adaptation in uh, black America. Yes. This has been Dr. Jerry Klein Bailey, a wonderful interview. We have to get him back and talk some more about this. His research is fascinating. Um, until next time, goodbye.